Welcome back to Weekend Walkabout in our gardens and yours virtually. We're GardenAtoZ.org. I'm Stephen Nicola. I'm Janet McConomich, and our topic today is late winter pruning. Why, what, what? and how? And uh, that's me, that's Stephen, and with us in the chat, moderating the chat, both as a gardener, she's an excellent gardener, and she's also a professor at a university and excellent at the technology involved in these meetings yeah. uh, and can help you out with technology questions if you if you will just open your chat and uh, get in on the conversation that's going on there. Um, if you have questions, you can type them in the chat anytime you'd like, put them in the chat. Sonia will either keep them for us and line them up when we get to a, a little break, um, or she'll break in if it's something that needs to be done right away. Right away. There is a note-taking guide. It's called Late Winter Pruning. But um, those of you who've been with us on these webinars for a while know that there are a lot of pruning uh, uh, guides for you to look at. This one you can download, and uh, it will give you the main points that we're covering today. But there are others. Um, so if you have not looked at it, um, do take a look at it. We've got a guide on the webinar page you can download a guide that has all of the weekend walkabouts by category. Um, and, and one is a blown out one that has a, a description as well as the, the title. But you can look up what webinars we've already had, whether they're in the subscriber library, SL, or whether they're in the free library, which, which number it is. And that way you can find the note-taking guides from them. And today we're really going to be using a few things from webinar 23. Um, to tell you to, to go back to that and take a look at how long evergreens keep their needles so that you can figure out how far back yeah. you can cut a branch. Yeah, when evergreens drop their needles, some people get really worried and they have you have to look. If it's on the outside of the plant dropping needles, you got a problem. If it's in the inside, it's probably natural. Yeah. So um, that note-taking guide for, for the webinar, we can walk about number 23, had this three page, um, which pines and spruces keep their needles how long. And it also had about nine pages of this, which is what we call all the shrubs to cut now, when and how, where we listed all the shrubs that we could think of that people are, would be growing and wrote how to prune them. So for instance, that uh, azalea, it's a type of rhododendrons. If you wanna keep it tightly shaped and smaller than its potential, then five is the key that you want to have. And those keys, the cutting directions are all written out for you. So you just follow the number from one place to another. We are not going to repeat that. that now. Mm -hmm. We're telling you that that exists. And so that we don't get to a particular question about a particular shrub or you get out there and you realize, oh, I forgot about this one. They're in there. Mm -hmm. And you can download that um, note-taking guide just by going to the web webinar audi audience materials. Now, what we did, because we're trying to do things differently each time. We're, we we reinvent ourselves regularly. Um, <laughs> Causes we, a lot of work sometimes. Yeah, but we've, shown we you, we've shown you how we prune something. We say, here, here's a picture of it before, here's a picture of it after, here's a picture of a branch that we cut. We thought we would show you a way that it's an ongoing learning pruning exercise. Um, we went to several gardens where they do a lot of pruning. Actually, a lot. Uh, actually, most pruning. public gardens do a lot of pruning. This is Whistling Gardens in Ontario. It's uh, it's in Wilsonville, which is uh, south of Brantford. If you are cutting across Ontario, as we Michiganders do on our way to New York or Niagara or going up into Montreal, um, you, you need to stop at Whistling Garden. It's an incredible place. Yeah. But uh, there's probably 700 feet of boxwood hedge just in this one just in the, the picture garden. yeah just in the picture um and we also went to longwood gardens longwood is in kennett square pennsylvania it's uh right in the corner that almost is delaware and it was originally a, a pierre dupont's estate and not it, it was his it was his fun place it wasn't a place to actually live in yeah. it was to have parties and invite people over to um and they also have lots of things that they prune, not just hedges, but all kinds of plants. And people ask us, why would you go there in the winter when you could go there when there's plants up there doing this? Well, we go to see how things are done. You will find us, Steve taking pictures and me sticking my head inside the shrubs to look and see where was it cut? When was it cut? How is how are they doing this? In this particular small garden, there's little tiny green coming up. There's thousands of bulbs right there. Then there'll be 
another display then there'll be another you know it's it's, it's long with any time there's always a bit of time to see what's going on and uh also to the Dawes Arboretum which is in south central Ohio um this is part of their Japanese garden. They also do a lot of pruning of a lot of different kinds of things. So what we want to do is show you what we learned, what we saw, what we gathered as evidence to tell you about late winter mm -hmm. pruning in the midst of people doing their late winter pruning. We spent about an hour talking with the arborist and the nursery manager at Longwood. Steve uh, tracked down the guys that were cutting here. And, uh, and we spoke to the owner of Whistling Gardens about what they were doing. And we'll tell you about that as we go along. Um, Whistling Gardens is not technically open, um, but uh, we, he let us disturb his undisturbed snow, his, his except for critters. Snow, yeah, uh, to go in and take a look around. This is a one man garden. This With is one, one person who decided that I'm going to make a garden in farmland in Ontario. And in order to make a garden room, I need to have walls. So there are hedges and, and tree hedges everywhere, dividing the space and the, the acreage up. Uh, he has one helper that comes every yeah. every year for 10 months. Um, 20 acres. It is. Uh, uh, Darren Heimbecker is his name. His wife does administrative work now for him. But um, And yes. these places between Longwood and Dawes and Whistling Gardens have everything that you would ever grow. Evergreens, boxwood here, um, junipers, spruces, beeches, Ooh. hawthorns. Um, you butterfly did, bush, butterfly burrums, right. uh, uh, dwarf conifers. And they're cutting them in all different ways because, as we've told you before, how you do something when it comes to pruning depends on why you're cutting. Um, and cutting to keep a tree short and hedged you might notice that those look a little flat at the top. Making a hedge out of those trees is an entirely different kind of pruning than the pruning that you would do to train a young tree. Yep, entirely different. <laughs> um, and they have evergreen and deciduous uh, shrubs of all kinds, some of which are allowed to grow and some are, are trained and done in particular ways. They have everything you never wanted to see clipped into a hedge. <laughs> Um, and very old hedges. The walls of the outdoor theater at Longwood are uh, hedged topiary. And also, big. yeah, you can see how big something can get if someone gives it room and just lets it grow. This is at Dawn's. Is, and that's that's a nice size hedge, you yeah. know, in natural form. I zoomed in but on it and it's a prune. juniper, so yeah. it's got to have been there for a long time. And, and, and there it goes, goes. There it goes, you know. And it gets pruned. Keep it off just of the walkway. It now we don't go out to when we go to a botanical garden and we're trying to learn about pruning. We generally don't go out to the shrub. This is the shrub collection at Dawes. You, at botanical part gardens, they yeah part of it. At botanical gardens, they plant things to show you what the plant can do, and they just let them grow. Um, as Mike Durr explained it to me one time, he says you have to understand they just put them out here where they think they'll do, and then they leave them. That's it. Yes. They leave them out here. Generally speaking, that's how they do it. Yeah. So if you want to learn about pruning, you stick in these kinds of areas, the garden areas of a botanical garden, where they have to keep the boxwood from getting into the roses, and they've got to keep the grasses from seeding into the sedums, and they've got to keep the uh, climbing roses cl uh, uh, staked up properly, right. that kind of thing. So those are the areas that we go and crawl around in. And we go at the times of year when people are working. You can see the gentleman down there. His machine. You could see. He got partway done. You can see that they're cut. This, they there. did this. They did this side already. You look down this side. You could see all the nubs. You look down this side. They're they're going up there to do that. Now imagine having hand pruners Clip. and going up there and going clip 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 all, clip, clip. all day and, and as the arbors told us he said by the end of the day your back is killing you and your hands are killing you you don't take head shears up there to cut those. no they're clip 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 they they do they just got they just told us a new yeah. a new type of hand pruner that is uh electric you wear a battery pack on your belt and your the wire goes along your arm and and the pruners prune for you mm -hmm. they also it also comes with an optional glove optional for, you have to pay you for have it. to pay for the the glove that if i should happen to touch the pruners with that glove on the pruners will not close 
because otherwise they can cut your finger off. They would off take your finger off. off. You wouldn't even notice. But this is the, they're not, there's no magic involved and there's no secret uh, machinery or weapons. It's people doing this pruning. And uh, these these are linden trees. And they're, um, that's a, uh, um, a very common tree to tree. be used for hedges very like common. this. And these, there's, hunt, there's, there's going to, there's at least 150 of them in yeah. Longwood. So it's busy for arborists and gardeners at this time of year because if we cut before growth begins, we can select which way we want it to grow and where we want it to fill in. And which way this go? Yeah. And so this is the this is a linden. This is like one of the things that one of those those uh <laughs> bunches. I'm trying to think of what you would even call uh, the this is where they're pruning up at the top of the lindens. If you cut to right here on this branch, which has become dominant, Whoa. see all of those branches sprouted from the last time it was cut, but one of them got ahead of the others and has become dominant and is becoming bigger. If I cut to just above that bud, the new branch will grow in the direction that bud is going, which isn't necessarily a good direction. It may be a better direction to cut to the bottom bud. Or... To or, take or it, take it all the way off, uh, because and see um, what happens. Because as time goes by, you do take some of these branches back further and and let them start Re sprouting again. Um, this little uh, maple branch has been headed back, right here. Headed back to a side branch, which then took off and became this way, going in the right direction rather than going up. Um, we also prune this time of year because you can reduce your overall pruning time. If you make one hard cut now, as in a serious deep cut, you don't have to make cuts later. For instance, we cut um, we cut uh, um, boxwoods, and we've shown you boxwoods and ewes that we've cut back severely. Mm -hmm. You'll have to go and take a look at some of the other uh, like um, evergreens, shrubs, and trees or foundation planting in the webinar 74, the foundation planting. Um, we've shown you where you can cut back all the way and then you don't have to cut any more the whole rest of the year rather than coming out every time it grows another couple inches and taking a couple inches off. So you can save time that way. And because you can get around a lot better around trees and shrubs if the ground is frozen, frozen. or at any rate while the herbaceous plants it's are dormant. Long. Because here we are at Longwood. This is a, a very misleading picture in a way because that's a 300 foot walk to where you see the uh, mm. see the edge of a, a fountain there. And then and there's another 300, 300 feet, feet on the other side. And this is the winter scene. And look what's going on. I What are you gonna do? Are you gonna wait until all of those bulbs come up and then go trample everything? No, you better get in there before those came before those come up. So those are up now. They were not up three weeks, three weeks ago, ago when we were there. Um, In fact, they had netting. And that's one of the pictures I went back to get. Get the netting on there to keep the squirrels out. Uh, the netting was gone. Yeah, yeah, netting <laughs> Hundreds of feet of netting gone. Like a deer hunt's netting. Because this is what's going to be there. And there's no Similar. way. There's no way you're going to get to. Now, a lot of the things that are there, um, those evergreens that are in the center background, they're temporary. They're in pots. You can even see a bit of the black plastic pot there. Right here. Because that's one of the places where something, oops, where, where something like a banana will go um, later on. But at any rate, there's no way you can do those hedges this time of year. So even though it's a good time to do hedges in August, and we tell you about late August being yeah. a great time to do them, not in this kind of garden. And you can go see this garden and it'll never look this way again. It'll never be the same twice. It'll never be never, the same twice. No two years ever the same. No two seasons. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Longwood is amazing that way. Um, so for instance, this long uh, arborvitae hedge, which 25 years ago, I remember was a brand new hedge. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the blue evergreens that you see there are just temporary because that's all going to be bedding stuff. Yep. So you might think, well, it's going to be hard to work on that hedge with those blue junipers there, uh, those blue fall cypress there. No, they're just mm -hmm. going to move those right out of the way. Whoops, I keep going the wrong way today. And at Whistling Gardens, we've got the same thing going on. You see in the background a linden hedge. You can see where the tree's been cut and has whips growing up from the top. And then in front of it is a weeping Norway uh, spruce hedge. 
And then there's a boxwood hedge around the lawn area. You can see where they've been cutting there. And in the summertime, there's perennials of all kinds billowing Bit through all it. through this area. Yeah. So yeah. you better cut in the off season, yeah. even at your own house, uh, where where you put your annual flowers. You don't want to be trampling those. Yeah. When you, and, but this way, you can actually get to that shrub to do some thinning out and, and rejuvenating on it. And this ground cover, it's a St. John's Wort ground cover on that bank. Uh, it's going to get trampled on because you cannot keep your feet on just one little narrow no. board like that. And while there's not enough room to walk here. Yeah. So uh, so that ground cover is going to take some abuse, but it'll take some abuse in the off season. And it, it, can you go, yeah. look look at that's hand pruning? Um, you know yeah. that they they just bought a machine from France that's going to laser. That that, that that's will make it even maybe. better. But yet that's amazing. Yeah. Um, at Whistling Gardens, they, you bet he's going to be out doing it before the season because this is his display and sales area. Each of those enclosures is has where you go to look for your dwarf conifers. Is, for your he's, he's got great dwarf conifers. Um, it's also the, the, a good time of year because it's so easy to see the woody plant structures. It's so easy to look and say, I think that those branches are pretty well spaced on that beach yeah. and we don't have any clutter to, to uh, sort out. But you can actually get in underneath the crab apple and look and see whether or not there's some place that you need to take out. Isn't that isn't that a gorgeous form? Isn't it too bad that we can't just let them grow into the, the size that they are? Yeah. Weeping cherry, look at that. And people keep them so clipped up. But if you can get right underneath them this time of year, you can sort out which branches you want. Whether to you want some of the crossing or yep. Yep. Um, and this time of year. The critics out there are least likely to notice that you've cut something. <laughs> there it was up on the top, and here it is now. And as long as you pick up the branches so that there's no evidence there, then he who pruned doesn't have to answer it's to the feed who say, what are you doing? Really or vice plants. versa. Yeah, or vice versa. More in, likely in this case, vice versa. Well, vice in versa. this case, it's he. It's he. he did it and, and sent me the picture and said, look, I was brave enough to cut it. That's a, a panicle hydrangea. And I would have cut it even further. Oh, yes. Um, I would have yes. thinned out more of the branches. And you, left. you can tell her students are in the first uh, 15 years of being taught, they are very shy and won't <laughs> cut as hard as she will. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so since it's a good time to prune, what are we pruning? Start off with dead, damaged, disease stuff. It's winter damage, a lot of it this year from cracks and breaks. Yep. Um, and, a lot now. and a lot of things that you didn't see before because evergreens tend to, as the sap starts to rise, needles will turn brown and you'll see what's going on. And then there are also disease signs that you can be looking for on crab apples, on junipers, on weeping cherry, and on hydrangea. So um, you've got a, a redbud tree in the front yard and you realize that it had a dead branch. And then now you go and take a look at it and realize, well, there's a lot of dead. It's a great time to take out dead wood. Just get it out of there. It's, yeah. We're going to tell you it's the first thing that you do anytime you prune to shape something up anyways. Get the dead out first. Always get the dead out. It is Dead the, and, and unsafe wood. It is the unequivocal, unarguable stuff. You take it out. Um, or dead branch on our holly. I looked out. I said, what is a dead branch on the holly? and went down in and found that it was an old break. Uh, it probably had snow load on it, it, it years ago and was hanging in there. It, and then, it, we didn't notice it till this year and it's yeah. been broken for- Well, that's because the squirrels are so fat this yeah. year. One of them landed on it. <laughs> um, and whenever you're seeing anything that's, that's dead, as much as you can figure out what's going on. In, in this case with this false cypress, um, that whole area that's dying back makes the pattern looks to me like there may be a root problem with this plant. Either it's sitting in a wet area or it's girdling itself. But you want to take a look and say, I'm going to trim out the dead and I'm going to see if it comes back in the same places. I'm going to see. Yeah, the, this is, this is you, you know, how valuable is this plant? It may not meet your needs yeah. anymore and pruning may not even be what you want to do with it. Yeah. And you always want to look and say, okay, so you look a little brown, but you look browner. And, and there is a reason for it. 
Uh, and and it's a great time of year. Yeah, it's a great time of year to look and say, what's going on out here in the garden? Let the plants talk to you a little bit. Um, it's been breaking my heart that one of our favorite plants. Oops. oops sorry. One of our favorite plants, the Kusa dogwood, on the right hand side, it's the lower canopy. Uh, and there's its bark on the left hand side, has been dying back. See the gaps in it? There's a gap there. There's dead wood up in here. Yeah. Yep. And it's been being pruned. You can see cuts that are made on the trunks there. Here, here yeah. and up. Yep. Which is almost always a sign of some kind of girdling going on. And the, the base goes in without a flare. And you do see little roots around the edge. It'd be terrible to lose that one. But look for a reason for something to be dead or dying. Uh, if it's broken, well, then you don't have to worry about cleaning things up. But if it's diseased, if you see at the base of each branch that's broken, that there's discoloration, like on this red twig dogwood, Barb sent this picture in. She said, what do I do with this? The neighbors have been, uh, we, we neighbors have cut some red twigs from it every year for years and nobody's done anything to it. Um, red twig dogwood gets dead wood when it, it is infected with a, a canker. A canker is a fungus infection that starts in on soft wood yeah. and progresses from there. And all of the wood that you see here that's discolored, all of that wood that's black and brown needs to come out of there. First thing you do is you're going to take all of that dead out. You might be cracking it out. Mm -hmm. You might have to take a, a hammer and, and knock some of it out of there, but you need to get all of that out of there and then let the plant grow back clean from pieces like this one here. If I don't you know cut if it's it, got a spot on it. Yeah, that's good. but if you cut below there, it's rooted in the ground yeah. and let it come back up. They can do that because that's what they do so well. But take the dead out first. Questions about why we're pruning now or take or something that's dead? We're going to get more into the hows as we go along. Yeah. So there's a couple that will be how issues that will will come up uh, later. Um, but uh, um, Zoom user, I don't have a name yet for Zoom user, but Zoom user uh, asked, can I prune today if I disinfect with Mr. Clean or with Lysol after each cut? Um, yeah, if it's if there's snow on the plant and the plant is wet, then you would definitely need to disinfect after every cut. That's get, yeah. get pretty, pretty tedious, but but yeah, you can. Um, we're looking for days that don't go down below freezing. So you're looking for uh, an even temperature. We got that coming up on, I think, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, you, you want it to be above freezing during the day and freezing or just above freezing at night for a couple of days afterwards. We'll come back to that a little bit later too. So that's what Stacy was also asking about, just can we get a, a repetition once again um, about how to determine the best weather to prune temperatures versus moisture? Um, is, there a, is there a particular calculus or it's just that looking for the steady above freezing temperature and not wet? Yeah, exactly. Looking for the steady above freezing temperature. And no fast. Yeah, you don't big want drops. Yeah, you don't want big drops in temp in temperature. That's the main thing. You don't want to go from 50 down to 20, 20 degrees. That's that's what damages plants would. And also because I think this is sometimes useful um, about the weather issues before or after pruning. Um, that uh, if things get get wet or get really, really cold after pruning versus before pruning, how is how are we deciding based on based on that? Wet is only a problem when you're pruning. Wet wood is a problem when you are pruning because when the wood is wet and you are cutting into the wood, you are carrying spores from one part of the plant to another part of the plant and potentially infecting branches. I I've seen it happen a lot. Uh, red twig dogwoods, for oh, instance, okay. I've seen where people have taken head shears to a red twig dogwood and every single tip turns black with fungus. Um, after you cut, that's not a problem. The plant is not touching itself all over like you are touching yourself yes. all over. Um, getting cold is a problem if you cut back hard and there's evergreen foliage, and this is written in your note-taking guide this time. If there's evergreen foliage in the canopy and you're going to take most of that evergreen foliage away, it was the blanket for the interior part of the plant. And if it suddenly drops to below freezing, um, then that interior part of the plant won't have time to harden off and could die back further than you cut it. So cold after is what we're trying to avoid mm -hmm. and wet during we're trying to avoid. 
Okay, great. Thank you. I know that that's just often a uh, an issue uh, in questions. And a quick one from Therese. Um, can you ask why you felt that the, ask Janet why you felt that the false cypress damage is a root issue? Um, the, the pattern of damage where it's losing whole branches from the tips downward, and I didn't see any indication that it was a fungus infection, is usually because the plant is starving. And they starve when they, when they girdle. Um, they literally can't get a root out any further. So it's, it's, it's just a symptom I've seen before that I suspect is that that's what's going We've on. We've reached a point now where a lot of our first thoughts on plant, unless it's really obvious of a disease, is to look at the roots. Yeah. I mean, it's just... Yeah. Okay, so that's our one reason yeah, late we're pruning, reason one. And now we're going to go to reason two, which is because you can beat pests to the plants. 